I know almost everybody in the room. I'm Lucy Savitz, and um, this is the launch of our speaker series at the Center for Health Research, and I'm really very happy to know that we have a lot of people from the medical group, the health plan, and operations here joining us today. In fact, I, I know that we have a number of um, administrative fellows and interns here. Do you want to stand up, wherever you are? So please join me in welcoming them especially. And I've invited them all to come over to the center and meet you all and get engaged in the, the work that we're doing and um, learn a lot from each other. So thank you for that. Um, today it's a really special honor for me <laughs> um, to introduce our keynote speaker. Our keynote speaker was my boss um, for the last 12 years, but we've worked together much longer than that. Um, in addition to that, he's been an important mentor to me continues to be a mentor to me and is a dear friend. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Brent James. Brent. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, that's not on. How about now? Ah, there we go. Thank you, Lucy. It's a delight to be here and to meet new friends and uh, some old friends, too, um, here at CHR. I've long regarded, based on real experience, um, what I always called Kaiser Permanente Pacific Northwest as perhaps the strongest group in Kaiser. I've worked with all of the groups at various times. I'd put Colorado up there too. Um, so it's a delight to be here with you this morning. Uh, what I thought I'd do is tell a bit of a story. In some sense, it's my own story. Um, hopefully out some interesting messages for it. The year was 1986. Um, I just had a little personal tragedy. I suddenly became a single parent. It's just me and my three-year-old. I left the Harvard School of Public Health where I was uh, in the Department of Biostatistics. Technically as a physician, I was over at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, mostly doing randomized controlled trials of cancer therapies, largest multi-center trials group in the world, Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group about 450 contributing centers. We also supported CLGB and did almost all of the initial AIDS work too in the United States. Um, well, I left that setting and came back to Utah mostly to get close to family. I took a job at Intermountain Healthcare, uh, kind of sight unseen. It, it's really a funny story. I was a fairly typical physician researcher. I didn't know that administration existed. I really did. And to my shock and chagrin, after I'd been at Intermountain for a few months, I finally figured out that I was the third physician hired into Intermountain's administration, which was a real shock. Now, one of the first people I met was a fellow named Steve Busboom. He was Intermountain's vice president for finance. Uh, Steve, in 1983, a few years before, had built one of the world's first perhaps the first, what's called an activity-based costing system. And he deployed it uniformly across all of Intermountain's then 15 hospitals. We've grown a bit since then. We have 22 hospitals. Um, we have a physician group that employs about 1,800 physicians. We supply about 60% of all care in our region of the United States as a charitable not-for-profit. Intermountain Select Health has about 750,000 covered lives. That includes commercial business. We also have a Medicare Advantage plan, about 40,000 lives Medicare Advantage. A few years ago, the state of Utah converted all Medicaid to a Medicaid ACO. So that's rolled into it. And Intermountain is a charitable not-for-profit that actually behaves like a charitable not-for-profit most days on our good days. Uh, about three to eight percent of all of our true care delivery costs without adding spurious things to that number um, is true charitable care, care that we've identified as non-compensated before we deliver the care, you see. But we're at about, oh, I'd guess, pushing 40% of all of our care, we bear full financial risk, so we're not up to the level of a Kaiser. But the tipping point for this is somewhere down around 25%. So functionally, we behave more like you than we do like a typical US health system. Well, 1986. I show up at Intermountain, we've got this guy named Busboom. Um, he'd built this activity-based costing system. What it did was track every little granular element that we delivered to a patient 
on the inpatient side, any dose of a drug, route of delivery, time of delivery, we knew what it was. Every imaging exam, every lab test, acuity adjusted hour of nursing services, acuity adjusted minutes in a procedure room. Steve had somehow got his hands on a, a new emergent literature. Well, it wasn't really new. Jack Wenberg published his seminal article in the journal Science in 1979. But this idea of variation in practice was starting to get a little traction. And Steve's bright idea was to take his activity-based costing system and use it to measure the elements of care. You see, Wenberg and others, when they measured variation, it was at a geographic level. They looked at hospitalization rates using insurance claims databases. But Steve wanted to push it a layer deeper. He said, I wonder if we treat these cases the same while they're in the hospital. I wonder if this variation we're showing pushes a layer deeper to an individual patient level. You see. Um, I jokingly say all these years later that I believe that Bus Boom's forgiven me for what I did to him. Let's just say that I added a little scientific rigor to his question. The way I currently think about it, and I think it's pretty accurate, I was a trained clinical researcher and I was pretty good at it. What we were doing were taking the proven tools of clinical research and swinging those to focus on care delivery operations, which no one had ever really examined before. We were one of the very first groups to really look at that back in those early days. Yeah, in a two-year time period, we studied six clinical areas listed here. I'm gonna show you transurethral prostatectomy, common procedures at the time, very common within our hospitals. What we'd do is pull all patients treated with that condition over a fixed period of time, typically a year, we'd check to make sure the medicine hadn't changed, that we had a stable environment. Then the fun was Steve. Uh, Steve, yeah, your, your costing system's tracking interesting things, but it's missing some really important things as a clinician. If I just glance at it, it's clear you're missing stuff. I insisted that we form teams of physicians and nurses who actually did the care and expanded out. We roughly doubled the number of factors we had to track. Oh, Steve, the patients aren't all the same. They'll have different severity of symptoms for their primary disease at presentation. They'll have different comorbid illnesses. They'll have different complications. All of these will change the process of care. So I insisted that we abstract, extract from the written record every complication, severity of primary symptoms, every comorbidity, and individually stage each one. These turned out to be fairly expensive, these little quality utilization and efficiency studies. Uh, about, at the time, $50,000 a pop. These days, translate that to about $150,000. Almost all of it chart abstraction. And we built a team of nurses to do this for us, properly managed it, checking inter-rater reliabilities, those sorts of things. But we ended up with a very robust data set for looking at what happened during care. What we discovered is, is that when you drop to that patient level, the amount of variation you find actually goes up. The amount of variation in an individual patient level is higher than the amount of variation you showed at the geographic level. That's what we discovered. Just to illustrate, on the first thing that we studied, tarantula prostatectomy, the surgeons had identified two factors that they saw as critical. Neither of these were in Bus Boom's tracking system, by the way. Yeah, these are 16 high volume urologists. Uh, the low volume guys we analyzed separately. They have some very interesting patterns, as you might expect. The little green squares show true surgical cut time. Surgeons didn't want to be held accountable for the OR staff. So it's when they inserted their resecting neuroscope and started to cut to when they pulled it and said they were done. It's in the anesthesiology records pretty accurately, but we had to abstract it. The little red circles represent the primary purpose of the procedure. It's to remove prostatic tissue. It's how much prostatic tissue did you remove. The pathologists, they filter out the tissue, they squeeze the water out of it and weigh it. So 16 high volume surgeons laid out in grams per minute. So here to the left I have physician M, took 40 minutes to remove 40 grams of tissue on median. Far right, physician F took 90 minutes to remove 17 grams of tissue per patient. Now from 90 minute true cut time down to 38, that's a little bit more than a two and a half fold difference, 250% multiplicative difference. From 13 grams to 42 grams, that's a little bit more than a three-fold difference. And the crazy thing, you can see it in the slide, it's a very strong statistical result. As a surgeon, I trained originally in surgery, it's just flummoxed me. The longer you operate, the less tissue you remove. 
Now we had a reason for laying it out as grams per minute, and the quality part of the study would identify a major treatment failure. This procedure is performed for urinary obstruction so that elderly men can urinate again. Your prostate grows benignly as you age. The urethra that reaches from the bladder to excrete urine out of the body runs right through the middle of it and they'll squeeze it. And you do this thing to restore urine flow. Some of those men will reobstruct. So the major long-term clinical outcome we were tracking was reobstruction required and reoperation within one year. This is a metric we used. Oh, Hal Bourne, the chief of urology at our flagship LDS hospital in Salt Lake, the time that Dave Worland ran. Hal had found this obscure article in the urology literature that linked reobstruction to grams per minute. And we validated that finding, that complication concentrated in those three surgeons. So, in a sense, you're actually looking at a clinical outcome that directly linked to the variation in care that we were measuring. Uh, here's Bus Food's favorite slide. He's a finance guy after all. Yeah, M, 1,164 hospital dollars, true cost, to get a good outcome on a standard case. The high was physician H, $2,233, twice as much. Same patient, same outcome. Twice as much resource to accomplish that goal. Now, I've just done a little trick that I hope that you're sensitive to. Did you notice that I'm tracking clinical outcomes and cost outcomes in parallel? For me, that was serendipity. It was happenstance. It was because I was dealing with the vice president for finance and using his systems to help us do the measurement. But wow, that turned out to be important. Down the road a piece as we did this work. Now, long story short, without going into the details, we started to feed these data back to the clinical teams. We had to overcome some barriers. They questioned the data, of course. We worked our way past that, showing that the data were relatively accurate. Now, of course, some people felt challenged. They felt like they were being criticized. We shifted the focus from the person onto the process of care. We, we really asked a different question. In a judgment system, you ask who's good versus who's bad. In a learning healthcare system, you ask what's best. And they are fundamentally different questions. And when you shift to that what's best, it means that all of these surgeons can contribute to discovering what's best. Funniest thing, this is a summary slide. One looks better, one looks worse. When you get all of the detailed data out there, there was never a single instance where one person was consistently good or consistently bad. You were forced to conclude it wasn't a matter of picking the best surgeon. That if you were interested in best care for a patient, almost certainly it was scattered across a group. Or said another way, these all happened to be men. All of these men had a little something to teach and a little something to learn. And we were able to transform it into that kind of a setting. Long story short, when we measured a year later, we showed that the variation had declined rather substantially. In conjunction with that, our clinical outcomes had improved. The strictures had gone away. And our costs had fallen rather dramatically. The truth is, that was a completely unexpected finding. It flew directly in the face of all clinical wisdom at the time. Higher quality always costs more, by definition. And we seem to be showing a completely different result. It's Paul Batalden, a pediatrician from Minneapolis, from Park Nicolette originally, who introduced me to W. Edwards Deming. Dr. Deming had a theory that described quite accurately what our clinical research was showing, quality improvement theory. And then using his theory, we brought that home and started to apply it. See the idea? And that was the foundation for all that came after. Now it turns out this little example is part of a larger picture. Some years ago I was asked to testify to the Senate Finance Committee. That's kind of the committee of record for help in the US government finance, currently chaired by Orrin Hatch from Utah in the current debates. Um, we were part of the debate, the run-up to the ACA, Obamacare. And I was asked to testify four times, actually. But one of the things I did was take that research literature and I tried to summarize it into five major categories. You're familiar with that literature. It's mostly around variation. I guess I'll have to talk louder. But I broke it out for them in this way. So. If you were to do a Medline search right now, looking for studies documenting variation in care delivery at various levels. Uh, last time I did it, I rolled out just under 50,000 studies across the last about 40 years. 
um, in peer-reviewed medical journals. Um, amazingly consistent in findings. The number one finding from that literature, massive variation in clinical practice. The trouble is, is the variation is so large that it's pretty much physically impossible that even with full access to care, gold card insurance, pretty much impossible that all Americans could be receiving good care. In fact, what it shows is, is that where you live is more important than whether you have insurance and the care you'll actually receive. The idea that insurance is a primary determining factor does not withstand close scientific scrutiny is what you discover from that. Number two. Some people said, well, perhaps we can explain the geographic variation by inappropriate care. Inappropriate care is defined completely clinically. It's inappropriate if the risk inherent in the treatment outweighs any potential clinical benefit to the patient. This is mostly Bob Brook at Rand and his team, Lucian Leap, Mark Chass, and a number of other famous researchers in our field. They developed careful instruments for assessing this, came back and measured two major findings. The first is, is that inappropriate care does not explain geographic variation. Low utilization communities, on average, had about the same proportion of care judged clinically inappropriate on careful review by one's clinical peers as did high utilization communities, on average. Secondary finding, though, that was much more deeply troubling. Let's think, in that set of studies, I think the high water mark is carotid and arterectomy, Mark Jasson, 32% of all such cases performed were clinically inappropriate. The risk outweighed any potential benefit. They should never have been undertaken, but they were anyway. We've since had other trials that show an even worse results. The COURAGE trial suggested that half of all cardiac stenting is clinically inappropriate, for example. Now, I've never seen a good summary across the literature, so this is a guess. I am fairly familiar with it. I'd guess that about 20% of all care delivered in U.S. hospitals is clinically inappropriate. Oh, yours too, in Kaiser. Almost certainly. Number three on the list, November 30th, 1999, a report hit the, the streets. It's called the Arid Schumann. I'm sure you're familiar with it. That's where we estimated 44,000, 98,000 preventable deaths per year. It's what we call injuries of commission. And my name's on the report. I was part of that IOM team that produced it. Believe it or not, we were trying to be conservative. Subsequent studies have shown that we were. The real number is probably about 200,000 preventable deaths per year in hospitals where the cause of death was not the patient's underlying disease, but the treatments we used to address those diseases in a way that two independent physician reviewers in each case judged to be clinically avoidable. Now, in fairness, you can show that care delivery today adds about three and a half to seven years of life expectancy on average to every American's life. The upside is dramatically higher than the downside. And some people look at it just that way, that these injuries are just the unavoidable price that we have to pay for the manifest good that we routinely accomplish. It means they didn't read the second half of the report. What we showed was is that we had solid science by which you could dramatically reduce the injury rates without losing any of the benefit. That was the point, that we knew how to do something about it and that it represented a huge opportunity for better care. Number four, this is really Beth McGlynn at Rand. We have some areas where we have hard evidence of benefit. They're actually relatively rare. But clinical areas where we have treatments that we know for a fact work, they tend to be non-controversial. Beth took a whole bunch of those, went back and measured, and said, okay, for things that we know work, how well do we execute? How often do we perform them correctly? What she showed was that for adults, we get it right about 55% of the time, for children, 46% of the time. We call these injuries of omission. So the way to think about this one, if I can achieve miracles, doing it correctly on average about 50% of the time, well, what kind of miracles could I imagine if I did it correctly all, all the time, or, or something close to all the time? It means that it's not just that we're harming patients on number three, we're leaving a lot of benefit on the table in a system that cannot execute consistently. We call these high reliability organizations when you hear that term. And lastly, all of these summarized together into massive waste in care delivery. In 2010, another IOM committee, the Truth in Advertising, I'm a member of that organization on which I sat. We called together the experts, used mostly Deming's models to estimate waste in healthcare. We concluded that a minimum of 35% of all resources expended on healthcare delivery 
in the United States is non-beneficial from a patient's standpoint. A minimum of 35% and probably over 50% is what we said. Now, based upon a study that Lucy Sabbats and Jane Conrad did at Intermountain and then extended to other systems, my estimates are higher. I think it's close to 70%. When I used Toyota production system tools, or they did, you had a whole new category. Now, wait a minute. This year, the United States is going to spend $3.4 trillion on healthcare delivery. I'm suggesting that $1.7 trillion is recoverable waste. And I'd like to make that point a little bit later. I think that's just as real as it could be. By the way, best I can tell, that's true in your system too. What would it mean to the people you serve if you could deliver the same level of service for half the money in terms of your social mission, accessibility to care, the treatments that we could offer that otherwise would be too expensive? See the idea? Now, something to remember, all of this is coming out of what we do every day. It's coming out of well-focused health services research. This is where we're finding these sorts of opportunities and these sorts of answers. Well, next thing you need to know, mostly by serendipity back in 1991, we discovered a method by which we could address the variation. It happened in a big randomized controlled trial that we were running at LDS Hospital in Salt Lake City. The guy who led it was Alan Morris. It has to do with a disease called acute respiratory distress syndrome. The control arm had to do with ventilator management of this very serious illness in an ICU. We investigated and found massive variation in how academic intensivists were setting ventilators. At this point in time in research around this topic, everybody just assumed that ac academic investigators set ventilators about the same. Um, some of the finest evidence we have in all of medicine at strong physiologic models. Of course, when we found the variation, it called into question all clinical trials that had been done in ARDS to that point in time. Truly massive variation. Well, what we decided to do was to build an evidence-based best practice guideline. Well, actually, we had a different name for it. We called it a protocol in a randomized controlled trial. Remember that rule that if you don't deliver the care in the arms of a trial in a consistent way, you cannot causally link patient outcomes to treatment. This idea of internal validity. That is why we use protocols in the arms of trials. And we said, well, we know the answer to this. We need a protocol in the control arm. We set out to build it, and we discovered some really hard truths. It turns out that on average, I have evidence for best practice when I'm building that guideline. On average, perhaps 20% of the time. The vast majority of what we do in clinical care delivery has no evidence. 75, 85% of the time, physicians and nurses can hold legitimate differences of opinion about what works best because there is literally no evidence. When I say evidence, level three evidence is expert consensus opinion using formal methods in a published form. Level two, of course, strong observational designs. Level one, randomized controlled trial designs. But at a level three evidentiary standard, on average, we have evidence for best practice uh, 15, 25% of the time. It depends on the specific area you're examining. All right. Yes, indeed. Well done. Well, we knew the answer to that, too. Hey, there's no evidence. Generate our own expert consensus. Dr. Morris took about a year with the leading experts on ARDS in the world to do that. There's a problem with that. The guy who did the research was David Eddy at Stanford. If you review Eddie's work around expert consensus, what it'll do for you is completely destroy any faith you may have ever had in expert consensus as a basis for identifying best care. Seriously. Um, well, there's a third problem. It turns out most of this literature appeared in the 90s when guidelines were first introduced. So if you prepare your guideline and then you publish it, you use it typically we use an academic detailing model, a training model. So we publish this as an article and say, everybody read it. We do grand rounds around it. If you ask the physicians and nurses, the clinicians, if this was a valuable activity, at very high rates, I'll tell you that it was. It was professionally satisfying and quite valuable. If you ask them if they changed their practice after receiving this new information, they'll tell you that they did. You're already laughing, so you know the answer. What happens when you measure whether they change practice? A long series of studies showing no changes.
So that model of training the human mind and then asking them to apply it from memory to their patients does not stand up, all right? The last one on the list is actually the most important. Without going into details, unless you really want me to, I can make a compelling scientific case that you can't write a protocol that perfectly fits any patient, with rare exception. The humans who come to us for care are different from one another. They're genetically different, they're physiologically different, they're anatomically different, and any clinician knows this. We live it every day in delivering care and practicing medicine, and practicing nursing, you see? And we know it. Well, what we did was use an idea from Lean. Today we would call them shared baseline protocols. I just want to give you a feel for them. What you do is you pick a high priority clinical process, you build that evidence-based best practice protocol. Now I've just been listing all the reasons why they're unreliable. Do it anyway because of what's gonna happen next. Always imperfect, poor evidence, unreliable consensus. Build it out. When you get it to a functional level, what you do is blend it into clinical workflow so that it doesn't rely on human memory. We nearly always will start on a paper-based system, but then over time we'll convert it to the electronic medical record. The, the most common tool is a standing order set what we call clinical flow sheets, patient worksheets, action lists. We've got about 20 little tools. Basic idea, doctor, don't touch it, phone it in, be absolutely lazy, let it happen on complete automatic. What you're gonna get is evidence-based best care. And you build the clinical environment to deliver the care consistently every time around that evidence-based best practice guideline. Fair enough? This is arguably the hardest step in the whole thing. There's a sub rule that applies, thou shalt not destroy clinical productivity but there are ways that you can do it where it actually serves the clinician instead of burdening them. And so you really focus in around that to get it out there and play. Side by side with the clinical workflow, building a data system, also integrated into frontline care delivery. It's gonna do two things. The first, it needs to track any time somebody varies from the protocol. The fact that they varied and how they varied. And then side by side with that, a little technical jargon, you need a fairly complete set of intermediate and final clinical and cost outcomes. You need to know what happened to the patient at a process level and at a long-term outcome level. And when you do it well, you can blend it right into the workflow. It'll be the sorts of information that your clinicians must have to deliver care. And you can make it part of their environment so it doesn't feel like a burden. So the idea is, is up here, we're deploying into the clinical workflow evidence-based best practice decision support. And at the same time, you're capturing at the front line the data you need to show you what's happening, all right? So those two steps are kind of the key to this whole thing. Number five is the interesting one. The way I say it to my clinicians inside Inner Mountain, ladies and gentlemen, it's not just that we allow or even that we encourage, we demand that you vary from protocol based on individual patient need. I have strong evidence that I can't write a guideline that perfectly fits any patient. And doctor, that's why we have you. I need a thinking mind at the interface. Oh, by the way, we're gonna be tracking the variations. You will get as much scrutiny for complying with one of our guidelines too much compared to your peers as you will for complying too little. We're interested in circumstances in which you are different from your peers. If you're different, either we have something to teach you or you have something to teach us, you'd be surprised how often it's the second. But I have a circumstance in which I can tell what works. I've got data to help me understand what works. Now, most people call these guidelines, I tend to call them protocols. The reason is, is that derived directly from the protocols we were using in the arms of randomized controlled trials. It's like you took a trial methodology and embedded it in routine daily care so that effectively every patient you treat goes on trial. It's possible to learn from every patient. The last step's obvious, isn't it? If I were into the technical jargon, I'd call it a lean learning loop or a learning healthcare system where I take the variance data in the context of patient outcomes, feed it back to the team. Now when you do this, what you're gonna see are protocols that change fairly regularly. This is from the actual original ARDS trial 
They tried this first on patient number 29 in the series of ventilated RDS patients. They were tracking on that patient. Those clinicians followed the protocol recommendations 41% of the time. 59% of the time they chose to vary. But then they started that little feedback loop running. The thing you need to know is in the first eight patients across four months, we're getting about two patients per month. Oh, side finding. This works really well in small sample size problems. <laughs> really well. In those first eight patients, they put more than 125 changes into the guideline. Oh, wait a minute. Arguably, in my lifetime of building guidelines, this is probably the best guideline I have ever seen. Thorough evidence review, careful expert consensus across the leading experts in the world. But that abstract document changed wholesale when it hit clinical reality. This is a really important, consistent finding. Why would you ever trust an evidence-based best practice guideline that lacks validation data to show exactly how it performs, not just in terms of patient outcomes, but variation rates? Why would you trust it? What I was suggesting to you earlier is that the evidence suggests that you definitely should not trust it. Wait a minute, the guidelines we're getting from our professional societies or from AHRQ or from Cochrane Collaborative, how many of them have validation data? If you guess essentially zero, you've gotten the number right. They're fundamentally untrustworthy until you've lined them up to reality in a real clinical environment. And that's when you start to get data that are useful, is when you link it back to reality at this level. See the idea? Yeah. Yeah, when we did that in the ARDS trial, we had some surprising findings. Survival among what are called ECMO entry criteria ARDS patients, those are the most seriously ill. Survival improved from 9.5% to 44%. We saw a dramatic improvement in clinical outcomes. By the way, first time since ARDS was defined as a syndrome back in the 60s that anybody had shown an improvement in clinical outcomes, and it was a dramatic improvement that came from applying this method. By that point, we expected the cost to fall. Interestingly, physician productivity went up by a, a sharp amount, too. The, the reason is, is it took your most important resource, a trained expert mind, that physician, that nurse, and allowed them to focus their attention on a relatively narrow band of factors where they have maximal input. What you do is you automate the scut work. You know, so that they can focus on what matters and it increases productivity in a fairly general sort of a way. Now, just a question in passing. A funny thing happened with this one. This was a big NIH-funded grant originally. Um, well, they had this feedback loop running. They'd meet every Thursday afternoon. They'd come out of that meeting, and years on, they were still tweaking the guideline. You'll notice something. This rather dramatic change in compliance. We now have, well, 25 more years of experience with this thing. It's used by hundreds of ICUs across the world. We have yet to have a single patient, to my knowledge, might have to eat my words on this one someday, but not so far, where they were able to follow 100% of the guideline instructions. You can't write guidelines that perfectly fit patients. They're, they're too variable, they're too complex. But that shouldn't stop you. We have methods by which we can move past that, you see. Well, yeah, they continue to tweak it. Ten years on, we were still changing it every week. They're living, breathing, dynamic, track to the best science, generate the best science approaches. Built right into care, you see. What happened is the grant ran out. We had a medical informaticist, Tom East. He was embedded in the team. We'd come out of a meeting, then Tom would make all the changes. You didn't have to go through IT to get changes to your computer system. We had an insider. Well, the grant ran out and our funding for Tom ran out. Within Intermountain, though, we have this policy that we don't pay for research with patient care dollars. Pretty robust, strong policy. It actually makes sense. I was there the day that the intensivists trooped down to the hospital administrator's office, a guy named Rick Kagan. We wanted him to fund Tom so that we could continue to make the changes and we anticipated a pretty hard fight from this whole thing. Went in and presented to Rick, said about 10,000 a year to fund this part of Tom's salary so we can continue to make the challenge changes. And Kagan, Rick Kagan, had the most interesting response. He said, I'd be happy to. 
He said, this is the most effective case management system I've seen in my life. It's right here. See that little difference in numbers? Rick knew about that. Oh, for us, a quarter to a half of these cases will come without insurance. They'll be unfunded. And Rick said, I, I only need one of them a year to far more than pay for Tom. So this is case management on steroids. Of course, I'd be happy to, to do it. The trouble was this guy. Alan Morris is a really good researcher, and he was deeply offended that Rick would call his work a case management system. And he objected on the spot. He said, Rick, this is not a case management system. He says, this is a research system for continuous learning and generating new knowledge. We kind of all had to gang tackle Alan and drag him out of the room before he messed up the deal. So let me ask you, which is it? Did Kagan have it right? Or did Morris have it right? Is it a case management system for ideal care with best possible medical and cost outcomes? Or is it a system for learning from every case? And you can see the obvious answer. It's both at once, isn't it? It shows the role that research can play in routine operations, properly conceived and properly executed. You see that idea? Yeah, just a couple of more ideas. This is a more recent one. Turns out the number one cause of death in a typical hospital is sepsis, body-wide infection. Um, more than half of those cases will enter the hospital through the emergency department for ED admit sepsis. Typically in the United States, between 20 and 50% of those folks died a deadly condition. Well, a few years ago, Dr. Todd Allen in the ED, they're the blue line, Dr. Terry Klemmer in the ICU, that's where those patients go from the ED, the red line, started to build a shared baseline protocol. They were relatively slow. They kind of dinked around with it for four years. But over that time, that feedback loop, going from about 30% compliance up to about today, it runs at about 95. That was associated with a dramatic change in clinical outcomes. It turns out when we started, we were among the best in the country. We had about a 20% mortality rate, as good as it got. It's now been more than five years since we last went over 8%. Now this one's about 125 lives per year. Across Dinner Mountain's four biggest tertiary hospitals, this is 125 fewer deaths per year. I can't say exactly which person would have died who didn't, but the statistics are compelling. First thing you need to know, I have more than 100 of these. I can document well north of 2,000 lives per year. In the populations we serve, people who a few years ago would have died, who don't today. And this is not some sort of general hospital standardized mortality ratio. This is specific projects, clinically rigorous projects, where I can show believable differences in clinical outcomes. And you understand that mortality is kind of the tip of the iceberg. Dramatically larger impacts in terms of function restored and suffering averted. So the first key takeaway I want you to have from this, and I believe that this actually ought to be high on the agenda of any health services researcher, we count our successes in lives, literally. The purpose of this is to make a difference in the lives of the people who come to us for services. That's our purpose. It's not to publish. It's not to advance my academic career. It's not even to answer interesting questions. Our purpose is to change lives in ways that are meaningful. Fair enough. That's what we do, that's why we exist. That's what it means to be in health services research. Second thing you need to know, there's really nothing new here. I actually learned the main techniques in my surgical training back in the 1970s. This idea of shared baselines, technically in lean theory it's called mass customization, but that's how I was trained to perform surgery. And that's a key finding just in passing. It's why it's acceptable, more than acceptable, intriguing, almost mandatory for good clinicians. It's not new to the practice of medicine. And it makes it usable if you come at it from this angle with your clinical colleagues. It's just to make the point, wait, wait a minute. This is how we've always done it. Doctor, you'll have a standard approach for working up chest pain in your internal medicine practice or in the ED. 
you, you know you're going to adapt it to every patient. No two patients are ever exactly the same. Same idea. In fact, the only difference is instead of you having yours, you having yours, you having yours, me having mine in the same practice environment, our, our personal approaches, what if in a shared work environment around a common clinical condition, we had ours? That we come together and agree upon a shared baseline around which we vary so that it's possible to measure and it's possible to build in a support infrastructure that executes against that defined standard. See the idea? It's not a new idea. Now, the lean guys claim to have invented this. When Momac published his book, The Machine That Changed the World, it appeared in 1990, he claimed that this was a new invention of lean. That is not true. That is technically not correct. The healing professions have been using the method at that point for at least 70 years. We just hadn't put a fancy name on it. All right, Lean was kind of second to the party on this one. Another quick example, this is what I like to call a third generation medical home. First generation, we ran a series of quasi-experimental tests, step wedge designs. It was really complex diabetes mellitus, type two diabetes with at least three significant comorbid illnesses. The underlying operational issue, Linda Lankman, the surgeon who heads Intermountain Medical Group, raised the question, they wanted to embed care management nurses in our primary care practices, but we had no funding for the nurses. And Linda said, wait a minute, I can't bill for their services. This is gonna damage my budgets. Some of her colleagues were making the argument that if we had this in place, our clinical outcomes would improve, our hospitalization rates would improve. The one we didn't expect, physician productivity improved. So we in the Institute ran a nice little quasi-experimental design I would argue it had stronger internal validity than a, a typical randomized trial because it was well executed. And when I was able to show Linda that her cost of operations dropped that profoundly, that's when Linda decided to deploy care management nurses into every practice in Intermountain because she had solid evidence-based administrative answers. But it had directly to do with care delivery operations. The next issue, Brenda Reese Brennan shows up and wants to add psychologists in our primary care practices, what we call mental health integration. Same question, Linda, I don't have funding for the psychologist, it's gonna destroy my budgets. Same answer, we ran a trial. And showed that yeah, your costs for managing these cases is gonna go up about $900 a patient when you properly identify depression in a primary care practice. But if the psychologists are there, your total cost of operations are gonna drop by about 1,200. You'll come about $300 to the good for every patient. Far more than enough to pay for the psychologist with a better clinical outcome. See the idea? The third layer, well, this is a slide derived from the article we published in JAMA last summer on what we call team-based care. Level three, we added in care coordinators at a community level, mostly social workers, a little bit of geriatric medicine, a little bit of palliative medicine built into our primary care clinics. And this is just the financial outcomes. By the way, the clinical outcomes improved. Yeah, we watched our emergency room visits drop by 11%, hospital admits by 22%, other specialty visits and admission dropped by 21%. Not too surprisingly, primary care visits went up a tick. That's what you kind of hope for. Urgent cares are our walk-in primary care. You'd much rather have patients here than down here in the ED, which is where they would otherwise go. Radiology tests fell by 11%. I didn't put it on the slide. As I recall, lab tests fell by 12. Well, on the purely financial side, when you ran it all out, across about 200,000 patients, our cost to deploy was about $22 per member per year. Our medical expense dropped by about $115 per member per year. And this was pretty serious money for us for better care. You see what we do as a research group? We're directly integrated into care delivery operations. That's the basic idea behind it. And that's our primary mission. How do I tie together my learning activities into my care delivery activities? And holy cow, it's a rich field. Wonderful questions, great topics, huge opportunities. Now, the other takeaway, better care is almost always cheaper care. More on that in a minute. Now, the other thing you need to know, back in 1995, the senior administration at Intermountain Healthcare, our CEO, 
Bill Nelson, asked that I develop a strategic plan to make this kind of clinical management part of Intermountain's core business strategy. We called it clinical integration. Really, it starts with something called key process analysis. Remember how you build a shared baseline around a process? When you take those key processes, you have to build an integrated management information system. That's the variation data and the patient intermediate and final outcomes data, right? You're gonna discover if you build them purpose specific for this, you'll end up with very different data sets than if you rely upon what's captured by other methods. Um, and I would argue that it's probably the richest research foundation you can build. It'd be a fun discussion. I've been having really fun conversations with the Swedes about this with their registry systems. And I think they're finally convinced based on their own experience. This is how it should be done. Then you have to build an operational structure to manage it. I won't go into the details of that. Well, we did it. And then our CFO, Bert Zimmerle, he made an interesting point. He says, you know, given our mission, uh, we're way into quality, but if care is not accessible to the patients we serve, the quality of our outcomes have very little meaning. If care is not affordable, people can't get our benefits, can they? So he set a goal for the Intermountain system. He called it CPI plus one. He said he wants our burden on the community, our rate increase in terms of total burden to the communities we serve to be a maximum of consumer price index inflation plus 1%. He wouldn't let me say GDP minus one, GDP minus two. It means that you bent the cost curve and the healthcare would shrink as a proportion of the total United States income growth year over year. What you're doing is eliminating waste. Remember that waste idea? Over 50% waste? Well, as you take out waste, your clinical outcomes improve and your costs fall. Now, Utah is growing. We get a fair bit of immigration. We have a fairly large families. The need for our services is growing beyond just general population growth. We have some major demographic shifts. Uh, it's not just the obesity epidemic. The big one is actually the baby boom moving into their chronic disease years. You're familiar with this. There's a third major element. It's the new technologies that are usually more expensive that appear. Well, if you look at inner mountains, conservative projected growth, burden on the community, total revenues. That's the curve. We actually, our baseline included the Great Recession, which as you know, attenuated healthcare cost increases. So with that as a baseline, this is a very conservative estimate. To hit CPI plus one, that's where we needed to be. It meant that by the end of 16, we had to take 13% out of our total cost of operations, about $730 million. It shows the first four years where I have accurate data. By the end of 15, we'd taken out at just under $700 million. We'd already hit the 13% target. And by the way, I really believe it is close to 70% waste. So that's a pretty good start on what is actually possible. Did you get the picture though? What does it take to do this kind of analysis? What does it take to set and execute this kind of a vision? Well, at least in our mountain, we used a, a robust research group who were focused on questions of clinical operations. We took the skills imbued in a trained clinical researcher and gave them some research questions that had real meaning in the daily lives of the people that we serve. In terms of granular single processes, particular areas of investigation in terms of the overall performance of our system. And I would argue that that shows that it worked out rather well. Now one other little idea with this, we call it the learning healthcare system. I serve on that group for the National Academy of Medicine too. Imagine that I build a system for clinical management. I've just been describing it to you, all right? I justify the required major financial investment. It does cost some money to build it, but I do it on the basis of care delivery performance, the best clinical result at the lowest necessary cost. I've been showing you some of that. But then I use the resulting clinical management data system, well, not just to generate true transparency at the level of clinician-patient interactions, that's probably the most critical part, but also to learn from every patient. We call it type one research. 
Currently in our Mountains Enterprise Data Warehouse, we have 58 big clinical registries around specific conditions. So you have the clinical decision support going out to the front line as the care is delivered. And then in the same encounter, you're capturing the data that then feeds back to the registry. It means that most of our registries are up to date within about a day because you integrate it. You see? Yeah, it follows every patient longitudinally over time. Those 58 big processes represent about 80% of all care delivery, inpatient and outpatient in the Intermountain system. Type one research is research where you pick study questions that have a relatively immediate impact on care delivery performance. I usually generously say within a year. That within a year, I'll be able to make changes to care delivery that have a measurable impact on our performance for the people that we serve. You see, for type one research, I can justify spending patient care dollars for what traditionally would have been called a research function, can I? Because it links directly to care delivery operations. Type two research is traditional grant funded, investigator initiated research, and there's a wonderful overlap between those two, as you might imagine. Type three is collaborations with other institutions, type four is industry-funded research, at least in my nomenclature. But one of the things we're really trying to do in Intermountain is to actively encourage, advance, fund type one research. So I often find myself going to my research colleagues and say, ladies and gentlemen, if you are willing to address these questions, we'll have some funding for you. You might even think of it as seed money in some sense. If you can attract external grants, that's just icing on the cake. You're finding somebody else to pay for what I plan to do anyway. And we've been fairly successful at that. Well, just to give you a sense, 2015 Type 1, that's where Dr. Savitz actually and Jason gave me my best current summary, you need to update it. You're gone. How am I going to do that? Well, I'll have to find somebody. Yeah, our Women's Newborn Clinical Program, 84 peer-reviewed articles. Cardiovascular, 64 articles, 67 abstracts, 15 other what we call academic production book chapters, editorials, and the like. We had other clinical development teams that published fairly extensively, just not as prolific. But in that year, we published 399 peer-reviewed articles out of what is technically a community-based care delivery system. What you're looking at is type one research. Crazy thing. I believe we're getting more research production out of our type one research than we did in the past out of our type two, three, and four research. And the reason is it's integrated into our operations. So, so I asked you earlier, is it a case management system or is it a learning system? And the point is, is the two overlap. See that idea? Kaiser Permanente Northwest needs you. It needs you for your clinical success and your business success. And you need them. To do that, though, you're going to have to focus your time and attention on questions that have a relatively immediate impact on care delivery operations. Oh, the only way that will happen is if you're willing to collaborate shoulder to shoulder with those who are delivering the care, to understand the questions that they face, and then apply those wonderful skills that you've spent so much of your life developing to address things that really matter. You know, it's funny, I go to a lot of health services research meetings and usually after the conference, they'll over dinner, a completely predictable plaintive cry. How do we get people to use our research results? I've had this great idea, I've published this great study. You know, it seems to be really low uptake. I'll tell you the answer, guys. Focus on the things that matter to them. Get side by side with them and see what questions they're asking and put your skills to that question. That's how you'll get uptake. It'll be directly connected, it'll be immediate, and you will be able to say with me, I count my successes and lives. I predict that it's the best way that you can possibly develop an academic career, a research career, is by doing exactly that. Now, for me, the framing model is process management. Deming's core theories, we call it care delivery science sometimes these days. 
the idea that you identify key processes, nearly always better clinical results produce lower cost. You need to track the cost too. That's part of your measurement. You know, cost is just another number. Just toss it into your study while you're at it. Now under fee-for-value payment, which is a model that Kaiser uses by definition, 100% of your care, you get an insurance premium, that's fee-for-value. Those savings drop to your bottom line as a system. So you're not just developing new knowledge about better care for publication, you're ensuring the long-term success of the system of which you're a part, so that you'll have a chance to do that next year and the year after and the year after that down the road. Some of it will take the form of the savings of unused capacity, but that's okay because we know that demand for our services is gonna to continue to explode. It's just gonna move up and up and up. It means it will be far more efficient and perhaps, perhaps, we can actually deliver state-of-the-art care that people can afford and change the trajectory of this country. Oh, by the way, same problems across the world. So your hand will reach beyond the borders of this country to the free world. See the idea? That's what I wanted to share with you today just as a vision for what it means to be a health services researcher, what it means to be in the CHR, um, and say thanks for your time and attention. Comments, questions, thoughts, ideas? Thank you.